Coming up, the United Kingdom has a 94-year-old head of state. I wish her many long years yet, but at the risk of offending some viewers, realistically, we need to talk about the death of Queen Elizabeth II and what that means for the future of the monarchy. Before we get into it, please hit the like button, subscribe and get notified of new videos every Wednesday and Saturday. I'm naturally inclined to be a Republican. Not in the American sense of being a swivel-eyed lunatic who believes Hillary Clinton is running a child sex ring out of the basement of a pizza restaurant while bathing in the blood of babies. What I mean is, I don't like the idea that in Britain we're not born equal. That some of us are superior to others just by dint of whose vagina they came out of. And it's not just the 23 official members of the royal family I'm talking about. As of today, there are 810 hereditary peers sitting in the House of Lords entitled to a daily attendance allowance of £323 from the taxpayer, debating and amending legislation affecting me and you, purely on the basis of whose birth canal they were sprogged from. No one voted for them. In most cases, they're there purely because a distant relative fought alongside William the Conqueror in 1066 or agreed not to oppose him. And their ancestor's reward was a hereditary title and a British estate taken from the indigenous British by the Norman invader. We're now in the 21st century, yet 99.99% .99 of us are literally second class, I would say citizens, but of course we're not, are we? We're subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. To me, that feels almost childish. And you'd think it's about time we grew up, but royalty depends on popularity, and YouGov polling in 2020 put Elizabeth II's approval rating at 69%. I'm pretty sure that if there was an advisory referendum on abolishing the monarchy today, most people would vote to retain it. We recently ran a poll of our viewers here on Truth to Power, and our viewers are generally on the left politically, and even amongst our viewers, the results bore this out with only 27% thinking we should replace Elizabeth II with an elected head of state as soon as possible. What you can see in this poll, though, is that only 15% of our viewers wish to retain the monarchy under a Charles III. OK, I know that's only a sample number of a couple of hundred from a potentially biased population, but that same YouGov survey I mentioned a moment ago is based on a large sample from the UK it puts Prince Charles' approval rating at just 40%. I think feelings about the monarchy will undergo a seismic shift after the demise of the current Queen, and I'm pretty sure that abolition of the monarchy will no longer be an issue for just a minority like me. There will be wide-ranging debate about the future of the monarchy and its place in a democratic society. What are going to be the main pillars of that debate? Well, royalists will argue that the new king, Charles III, will remain a symbol of national unity by keeping his own counsel and staying above the political affray, untouched by the grubbiness of the layman's politics going on under his reign. But Prince Charles has a history of interference in ministerial decisions going back to at least the Blair government. Anyone remember the infamous Black Spider memos, so-called because of Charles's terrible handwriting? He sought to influence the government of the day on issues ranging from badger coals, the provision of non-tested herbal medicines on the NHS, and our military presence in Iraq. Oh, the royalists might say, but he wouldn't do that as head of state. Well, the Queen has also acted in a similar fashion, using her soft power to lobby to get certain laws changed. Most worryingly, intervening to prevent public disclosure of her private wealth. There are also reports that she investigated the possibility of dismissing Boris Johnson in 2019 when he illegally instructed her to prorogue Parliament to avoid debate on the hastily drafted and ill-thought-out Brexit bill. So for those arguing that a benign head of state with no real power is a perfect solution, I would make two counter-arguments. One, that the monarch does have undefinable soft power, and this has been used behind the scenes, unconstitutionally, and with no public visibility of what government policies are being influenced. Profoundly undemocratic. And two, I would argue that we actually do need a head of state with explicit and defined powers to hold the government of the day to account. Boris Johnson's illegal prorogation of parliament, or Tony Blair's illegal war with Iraq, are both 
classic examples of why this should be so. A lack of serious checks on government is dangerous. And although I accept that the House of Lords manages to get the government to moderate its mistakes from time to time, a second chamber stuffed with hereditary peers, Anglican bishops and political donors and cronies is hardly a perfect solution. I think abolition or even reform of the monarchy would have to be hand in hand with abolition or reform of the House of Lords. And this is such a constitutional shift that I can't see it happening in the current post-Brexit climate of nationalism, British exceptionalism and general flag shagging. And I admit there are arguments in favour of the monarchy, some stronger than others. One of the weaker ones is the cries of pro-monarchists who suddenly develop an interest in the tourism industry. Ah, the monarchy brings in more money from tourism than they cost the taxpayer, they say. Firstly, I pay my taxes, but I'm not in the tourism industry. So I pay for the royal family, but I don't get any direct benefit from tourists. But secondly, and more importantly, when the current government shells out 552 times as much on the failed test track and trace system as they do for a whole year of the royal family, even I have to admit, the cost is pretty irrelevant. Though I can't help mentioning that according to Expedia, Paris is the most visited city in the world. And we don't need reminding of how the French dealt with their royal family. The strongest argument for maintaining the monarchy, though, is what the alternative might be. To have a Russian or American style president is frankly quite scary, especially so soon after that last guy in America. President Priti Patel? Or President Farage, anyone? My ideal solution? Probably an elected head of state who has never previously served in any party political capacity before and who has the powers to challenge laws passed by parliament. And their election should be on the single transferable vote system that works so well for the mayoral elections. But that brings up the more pressing issue of the need for electoral reform across all of British politics and an end to the antiquated first-past-the-post system that sees MPs and councillors often elected by a minority of their electorate under the current unrepresentative system that favours the two main parties and especially the Tories. The fish rots from the head, they say. So perhaps the abolition of the monarchy is the only place to start a radical shake-up of our democracy. What do you think? Leave a comment down below.